Hi, I'm Stefan. Nice to meet you all. I've been giving the very hard task to entertain you between now and the uh, entertainment later on tonight, so I'm going to try and do that with storage. Uh, <laughs> So my name is Stefan, I mentioned that I worked uh, vig at Vigilance IT in Sydney uh, and I'm a solutions architect. So tonight we're going to go a bit under the cover, deep dive into storage versus direct. Now before I start, show of hands, who have heard of storage spaces? Yes. Who have heard of storage spaces direct and who has used storage spaces direct? Okay, all right. Well, at least we've heard of it, right? So. Um, so we're going to try and, and, and go very fast on the, uh, what it is and the concepts and, and try to deep straight, go straight into it. Um, so tonight, this afternoon, um, we're going to see just a, a quick evolution of storage, where we were and where we are today with, uh, with Storage Spaces Direct. Um, then we're going to go under the hood, see what, uh, what's happening there, how it all works, basically. Um, then we're going to go really deep into the caching, um, which is one of the best features really that, that makes storage spaces direct what it is compared to storage spaces. Also the resilience and performance. Um, I'll show you some demo there on what, what the system can do. And then we'll go through some demystification of, you know, you've probably heard a lot of that storage spaces direct, what it can do, what it can't do. Um, you'll see that pretty much most of it is wrong. Uh, <laughs> So, but anyway, let's get straight into it. The evolution of storage. <laughs> um, that's it, that's the end for me. Have, have, have nice beers. Um, so if we look at where we used to be, uh, or where some people still are today, um, it's really to start with the SAN model, right? So what's a SAN model, really? What, what does that look like from a very high level architecture? Well, you've got your compute layer, so I all, I'm hoping that Pretty much everybody now is using virtualization that is VMware or Hyper-V. So you, you end up with a, a bunch of compute nodes um, that will really communicate with your SAN through fiber channel, iSCSI, all the traditional methods, basically. Underneath that, you then have your SAN, your storage area, right? That's traditionally an EMC, a Dell, whatever it is that you're using today. And that's really kind of a black box, although it's red. It's, it's really not visible. So all the manufacturers out there really try to make that a box that they come and deploy in your environment and say, we're going to maintain it all for you. You don't have to worry about what's in there. But really, if we look into it, what do we see? We really see there's disks, there's a SAS controller, there's a backplane, there's a few controllers, and then there's that storage software layer here. And that's really where the SAN manufacturers are making their money. That's, that's their know-how, right? That's what they're trying to protect. It's that software. The hardware underneath is just a bunch of disks with controllers and a backplane. There's nothing more to it, right? So going forwards, what Microsoft has tried to do is to say, well, hang on a minute. Now that we know that, that really a SAN is just software, why don't we try and do that? So they came up with storage spaces in 2012 and 2012 R2, right? And if we look at that model today, what does that look like? Well, the compute layer is still the same. You still have your Hyper-V, your VMware on top. Hyper-V, let's, you know, forget about the legacy stuff. Um, <laughs> I stole that joke. <laughs> the communication channel is still there, but it's slightly different. We're talking about SMB3 now, okay? And underneath that, we have a set of scale-out file server. Now, we see the similarities in terms of the storage software of what that looks like. So we're now talking about a set of Windows 2012 R2 or 2012 servers clustered up, presenting a share up to your computing layer. And underneath that, we have a SAS and some shared disks. So the two models really are not dissimilar at all. As a matter of fact, they're very, very similar. It's all about that storage software again and allowing you through storage spaces to actually bring that back to you and say, well, I know Windows, I know how to deal with that, so I'll just do it myself. And reduce that cost that SAN providers today slap you as a premium to actually maintain all that. So that was storage spaces. In 2016, Microsoft, let's get rid of the other legacy stuff, 
Microsoft came out with storage places direct. This is what we're going to see today. Um, and with two model, and I'll see the next one after that. The first one is a, is a converged model, what they call the converged model. And if we look at that, again, your Hyper-V compute, SMB3 layer, and then underneath that, we still have a scale-out file server, but now we no longer have that SAS and that shared disks underneath it all. It's all in every single node. Okay, so now we end up in a model where it's a shared nothing model. Every single disk is in every single node and presented to every node. And it's the storage software that will deal, uh, that, will, that will take care of presenting all those disks to all the nodes and sharing that up to your compute um, layer. So we now see we don't need expensive disks anymore, right? In the past with storage spaces or your SAN, you need at least dual port disk because you need to share that through a dual controller, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need that anymore. You can just use cheap disks if you want to. Right? Performance might be a factor, but we'll see that later. So next to the converged model, which is this new model, Microsoft has also come up with the hyper-converged model and said, well, now that we've got this scale out file server there just running on Windows, why don't we combine the two and say, on all those servers there, why don't we run our compute layer as well. And so now we're coming into a comparison with the two where we go, okay, for probably more small and medium businesses size, you can now have a complete storage and compute solution in just under one roof with upper converged model, right? So when, when we see where we come from, which, which is with SANS, and the amount of investment that you needed to do to actually get a proper SAN storage in your environment, bless you, and the compute layer on top of that, to where we are today with potentially an upper converged model, you see that you really are using the most of your hardware for a fraction of the cost of what a SAN would cost you to implement, right? So how do we set that all up? Well, I'm gonna go in a demo just now, and I'm just gonna tell you what we're gonna do, which is four nodes, each of the nodes as one NVMe, I'll come to it. Anyone has heard of NVMe and what it is? Oh, beautiful, we're gonna have fun tonight. Um, NVMe, one NV NVMe per node, although that's not the recommended model. That's my lab, that's all we can afford really. Uh, four SSDs and eight HDD spindles in each of those nodes. So the first thing we're gonna do, and we'll see that in a minute, we're gonna cluster that all up, cluster that up. Right? We're gonna create a cluster, just a simple Windows cluster like any other cluster that you've created before. But now on top of that, we're gonna pool that in the same way as we did with Storage Spaces and Storage Spaces Direct. By enabling Storage Spaces Direct on top of the cluster, all those disks are gonna get pooled together in one available pool on which we can now build volumes in the same way on your SAN when you were building LUNs, same thing. So let's have a look at that in a minute. Um, For this one, I did do a video. Reason for the video is that, and I want to emphasize on, on uh, how fast you can actually create um, a storage space. Um, I've got a live counter here and you'll see it'll spin up faster when I've accelerated the video so we don't have to just twiddle our thumbs when we see a progress bar, right? So the first thing we'll do, you'll see there, I'll just run a get physical disk command to actually list all the physical disks that are currently in that specific node where I run it from. And you can see we've got um, my eight spindles, followed by the Intel there, which is my NVMe, followed by the four SSDs. You see here we're accelerating time, the real time. Just doing a test cluster. Very important if you want support from Microsoft, it's very important when you set up any cluster to actually run that. If you haven't run that and create a cluster, Microsoft will not support you. So very important to do that bit. Once that's passed, don't worry about the warnings, um, we now create the cluster, right? Simple command, one command, new cluster. That's really the start of the setup, that new cluster we create. That's done already after two and a, two and a half minutes all up. So now we can see we've got all our nodes that are part of that cluster with all our disks. Next thing, we're just gonna enable storage spaces direct on that cluster, right? So there we'll see in the command, we create a pool and I just renamed the pool to SPO1. 
Now this thing is just going. So it's now going to pull all those disks together and enable you to have that shared nothing that I spoke about, right? Now, that's done, five minutes. We're just going to create a volume per node on each of those four nodes, create a lump, basically, so that we can share that out to our, to our system, right? That's going there. Now, one, um, one important thing, yes, this is going to take eight minutes all up. That's it. That's all it takes to create a storage space that directs storage for you, eight minutes, that's all you need. What did I do before that? You might say, well, it's not really eight minutes, is it? Well, no, it's not, I agree. What did I need to do? I need to unbox my, my servers, put all my disks in there, rack it all up, connect all the backend network, assign an IP address, make sure all the nodes could communicate together to each other, install, in this case, we're gonna do um, an Hyper-V, um, Hyper-Converge demonstration. You can see there my cluster is created, all my volumes are there, my pool is there, so we're good to go. Eight minutes there, done. Um, all those servers that were there are, are basically just created networks so they could communicate with each other, and then installed Hyper-V, installed failover cluster as a feature, and that's it, and file server for the scale out file server. That's, that's all I needed to do prior to that, which is just simple installing Windows and installing those features and then run those commands. So depending on how long you take to unbox the server, rack it up and install Windows and create your networks, that's what you're gonna add to that eight minutes to actually get to a production environment where you can start using storage in your environment. I think that's pretty cool. So, so now that we've got that environment, so we have a four node cluster with Hyper-V installed on it, Let's look at what really is happening under the hood of that, right? Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is the storage stack. And that's really what I like to call the, from the down layer all the way up to your virtual machine, what is really happening, what are all those layers that you can see? Well, the first one is your cluster, pardon me. So you got your four nodes, again with your disks in there and the network in between. We'll talk about the network later on in the presentation and, and how important that becomes. Um, on top of that, we run that storage bus. Now, in the previous slide, you saw the, the software. That's this component. That's, that's the very important critical component that make storage spaces direct what it is today, that storage bus. Next to this, we have the storage pool on top of that, which is aggregating all your disks together and presenting that to the system as one big pool of disks. So no longer JBots, but pools of disks. And then, in addition to that, on top of that, we're gonna create virtual disks. Now, don't confuse that with a PHDX or a VMDK. It's not in that matter that we talk about virtual disks. That terminology there refers to your LUN, right? So in the same way as in the past, you would have created a RED 5 or a RED 1 plus 0, you now create virtual disk with a mirror or a parity, and we'll come to that in a minute. Once you've got that, you can then create a volume on top of that. And again, very important note there, REFS. Who has heard of REFS? Excellent. So REFS volume, you create on top of your virtual disks, and then you're gonna cluster those disks, those volumes. You're gonna present those volumes to the actual cluster so that they can be used for your virtual machine or your scale-out file server, yeah? So in this case, we'll see in the demo later, I'll actually have a, a bunch of virtual machines just running on those nodes and they're just accessing the C backslash cluster storage backslash volume instead of accessing a share through a front end network. Yep. So that's what virtual machine access either that cluster share volume or you install the scale out file server feature on top of that and you share that across to actual for, for your, your uh, virtual machine to access. So the very important component here, the the software storage bus. Um, this is really what makes Storage Spaces Direct what it is and how the system will interact with all the disks. So this will allow for each of the nodes to actually see every single disk like it is part of its own, right? like it's a local disk. And how that, how that works is basically you've got your normal nodes, node one, two, three, four, five, up to 16, um, with your application running on that, we spoke about the 
cluster chair volume on top, the file system running down the OS with your virtual disk, with your pool, etc. Then the important components, the cluster ports and the block filter. Now these act as, you could compare them in the iSCSI world as an initiator and a target, right? So every single I.O. that comes to the port will then connect to a target which is linked to a physical disk. So each of those drivers here is aware of what physical is there and present that to the port, to the initiator. They not only present that locally, but also through your network, through SMB, to all the other port, to all the other initiators in every node. So now your initiator knows, well, hang on a minute, I've got these 12 disks in my node, oh, but I've got these 12 disks there too. Now they might know. They next door to the other nodes through SMB3, but I don't care. I can see them. I can present them to the OS like it's just another local disk, like you would do in storage spaces when you had the shared volumes, when you had the shared disk in one big storage. Yeah? So that component there is where all the smart is going with storage spaces direct. We spoke about disk very briefly, and we'll come a bit later down the track on, on describing a bit more about, talking a bit more about NVMe, but it seems like you guys know um, a lot about it already, but these are the type of drives that you can stick into your disks, um, into your servers, basically. So when we talk about storage spaces direct, really we talk about three types of disks. Spindles, SAS or SATA, it doesn't matter, just put it in, it's all local anyway. SSDs, SAS or, SS, or, SAS or SATA, so you can go enterprise class, or you can even go desktop class if you want to. It's no problem. We'll come again later on when we talk about caching a bit, a bit further, a bit more in detail, how it is important to have other grade of SSD or NVMe when, when we use them for caching, because you need a lot of write per day, and I'll come to that when, when we come to that. NVMe, again, new type of SSDs. Basically, SSDs have run out of, uh, run out of puff. <laughs> Uh, through the SAS bus, you know, 12 gigabit is not enough anymore. Uh, so we basically decide let's put that on the PCIe bus. That's why you can get so much better performance through NVMe as opposed to SSDs for that compared to spindles. Now, when we, um, when we look at storage spaces direct, with all those type of drives, we can now do a lot of different type of deployments. So you can really mix and match a lot of different combinations through those disks. The first one is all flash. Now flash, again, SSDs and NVMEs are coming down in price a lot. So people more and more are thinking, well, why don't we just do all flash instead of using some caching for SSDs and then spindles. So this is what you can do with storage space direct if you decide to go all flash. You can have just NVMEs in your environment, NVMEs and SSDs and VMEs for, for caching SSDs for all your capacity disks, so effectively all your data, or SSDs for capacity and cache, right? Now, it's important to understand that no matter what you do, you will always have cache. And I'll come to that in a moment when we look at caching. The next one is the hybrid type of deployments where you can mix and match those things. So if today you think, well, hang on a minute, for my workloads, I don't really need SSDs or NVMEs for the capacity because I don't need all those, all those IOPs. So I might as well save a couple of bucks and go, well, why don't I put that spindle for the capacity and put either NVMEs or SSDs as the caching to absorb all the write and cache all the reads, right? And last but not least, you can have all three of them in one server. You can have spindles and SSDs for capacity and NVMEs for caching, right? Caching, let's talk about that now. So a few facts about caching. The first thing is not everything gets cached depending on what the environment looks like. If you've gone for an old flash system, your writes are being cached, but not your reads. So if you put SSDs for your capacity and your NVMEs as a front caching, all your writes will be absorbed by the NVMEs, but your reads will come straight from the SSD. Very important to note that. Because if you go ahead and say, well, I'm gonna save some money and go, let's just do desktop 
SSDs for the back end there for the, for the capacity. Note that your IOPS in terms of reads will not be as performance as your cache for writes because NVMe is much faster than SSDs. On the other hand, if you have spindles as capacity, everything gets cached, write and reads. Not really, but I'll explain that in a moment. <laughs> now, um, there's been a lot of talk about the, the real-time tiering versus not. Um, as you probably know, in storage spaces in 2012 and 2012 R2, the, the tiering mechanism to go from fast, cold, hot data to cold data was all based on, was job based. So at 1M or whenever you decide to run the job, the, the system will go through and move data around. Now, now, this is not really a great methodology because you might have a, a spike in a SQL server, for example, that will create all those all those IOPS that are going to get recorded. And then at 1 a.m., they're going to consider that data as being hot and move it to SSD. Well, that spike in SQL now is gone, and you don't need that data anymore, so it's not really hot anymore. So that was the case with storage space. With storage space is direct, your tiering comes from your caching, right? Because you are using NVMe or SSDs for your cache, they are permanent drives. So everything that gets moved from and to the capacity drive to your cache stays in your cache unless it runs out of space and it starts to rotate your drive. So we'll see at the end of the presentation, it's very important to define what your cache size should be before you actually go into production, right? That caching model, as I said, you can't really create a storage space direct without caching. When you enable storage spaces direct to your, on your cluster, by default, it's going to go and grab the fastest possible drive and assign it for caching. Right? Note that now that caching is completely reserved. So if you have, say, two times two terabytes of NVMEs and then terabytes worth of SSDs down there, those terabytes of NVMEs do not count towards the usable space that you will present out. They are caching. So they become your hot data, but not part of your usable space. Important to know. So the fastest drive gets automatically used for caching. When you write to your cache, the system will not straight away write that, that onto your capacity drives, right? It will wait and destage your caching from your cache to your slower, uh, through, through, through SDs or to your, your spindles, in an optimal way. And what I mean by that is, if you get 1K, a 1K IOP going on a stripe, and another 1K IOP coming on the same stripe, it's not gonna go and write two Ks, two times two Ks, it'll write one stripe. Does that make sense? So you, you, are, you have an optimal way of writing back to your capacity drives to destage your cache. Note that you need about five gig of memory roughly per terabyte of caching in every node, right? So again, you got two times one terabyte, you need 10 gig on your nodes of each of the, uh, of each of the devices. I'll come to that later on, but just to tell you now, the caching is, is per node. You cannot have one node with the cache for all the other nodes, okay? The caching is completely invisible from a storage space's direct perspective. Yeah, it's, on, it's on a node basis. Now, I mentioned that earlier. Not every read or write is actually caged the same way, right? And this is important. So writes that are less than 256Ks, question? Mm-hmm. Well, that depends on what resiliency type you chose, and we'll come to that later in the presentation. So if you chose a mirror, et cetera, et cetera, right? Two-way, three-way, we'll come to that. So in terms of what's being caged, writes that are anything 256K or below are caged. Anything above that is not cached at all, right? It's very important. Um, reads, and I'm reading from notes here just so I get it right. Um, anything below 64K reads will be cached on the first miss. So if you do 
a 32 KIO on your spindles, as soon as you do it, bang, it's cached. It's considered hot, it stays in the cache. However, anything bigger than 64K, you will need a second miss within 10 minutes for it to be cached. So if you have a, a, a SQL or anything that produces 128K IOPS, the first one will not be cached. The second miss will get cached in full. Sequential reads bigger than 32K are not cached at all. So that's for backup, for example. You don't want all your backup at night kicking off using 512 or, or megabytes IO to go and cache that all up. It's coming straight from the capacity drives. So these are, you know, when we say every read and, and writes are being caged, yes, but, dot, 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 what I just explained. Um, session is recorded, so, you know, you don't have to remember all those numbers. Um, so in terms of architecture, and I, and I did touch on this, if we look now at a, at a three-way three -way mirror system, whereby you need three nodes minimum to do, um, any write that will come in will always go through each of the caching devices. But the actual storage space's direct layer sits here. So the node is aware of the cache, the system is not. Right? So when an op comes in onto a node, it will automatically go to the cache if it's not you know, conditional on what I just explained. And then from the cache, go down to the capacity. Yeah, makes sense? Now, in terms of binding, how does the system do it? And you can see there on the representation, I'll pretty much give it away straight away. Um, it's assigned dynamically. Based on the number of spindles or SSD you have in your capacity, your NVMe or SSDs on top will be assigned to an equal number of spindles in the back end. So it is quite important to have a number of cache disks that relates to the number of capacity disks. If you have a, a, an even number of disks, best to have at least two or, or even number of uh, caching so they can be assigned. You don't want to end up in a situation where one cache has three disks and the other cache has two disks, right? You want an optimal way of doing that. Um, it is dynamic. So as soon as you add more spindles to the system, automatically the system will reassign the caching based on the number of disks and just divide that amongst, amongst the caching. The recommended number of cache device per node is at least two. And we'll see later during res resiliency why that is. There you go. It's on cue, loving it. <laughs> um, why is it two? If one of your caching device fails, which happens, the system will automatically rebalance the system so that it goes through the other cache, right? Or if you have four caching devices and one fails, it'll rebalance the three left over based on the disks that you have built up. If on the other hand, you only have one caching device, the node itself will be flagged as dead, right? So it'll fail, the node will fail because there's no more cache in it. So you really want two at least so that you can later on put the node in maintenance mode, cl maintenance mode cleanly and replace that caching device yourself instead of having bang. The repair of that is automatic, right? So I mentioned that your caching is now your tiering device because it's permanent. So all the data that effectively got lost, not really lost, from this caching device is now going to get recached and re-grabbed from other nodes that also have that data. Because if you do a two-way mirror, you know that that data is on another caching somewhere in the system. Therefore, the repair is going to be automated by the system to go, well, now that I've got that new caching, I'm missing some data here. I'm just going to go grab it from the other nodes and repair it myself. Yep. That's a very important node. There is no data loss here. Because you are using a mirror system, two-way, three-way, or a parity system, the caching is also part of that mechanism. There is always another copy somewhere else. In terms of the resiliency type that you can do, that you can create within, within Storage Spaces Direct, there's a few. We'll just quickly run through them. Two-way mirror. Um, this is your equivalent to red one plus zero in the old days legacy systems. Uh, 
Um, the minimum number of servers for that is two, of course, because you have for every data that is, that is written to one node, that same data is going to be written to another node. So it's completely resilient two ways. Now, the maximum node failure at that point is one. So you can lose a node and you'll still be up. Note that, again, if you lose both nodes at the same time, your data is not lost, right? You would need a catastrophic failure in this case to have all your disk failed in both nodes at the same time for it to lose data. Um, and the storage efficiency, of course, is 50%. Because from a raw standpoint, if you have a terabyte across both nodes, well, really, you have 500 gig available for you. Then there's the three mirror. Just quickly back on the two-way mirror, the recommended number of nodes is three, not two. So the minimum is two, the recommended is three. Why? You decide to do some patching on nodes A. So you bring it down, you start your patching, something happens to node B, your storage becomes unavailable. So you really want to be in a situation, a really highly available situation in your backhead storage, whereby if you do maintenance, you can still afford to lose another node with a three-node system. Three-way mirror is, a, is the same as a two-way, except now each of the data is recreated twice on two other nodes. So it's an additional resiliency. This is the recommended way. Problem is, you only get 33% efficiency. Because again, each of, each of the block is being written twice somewhere else. So you're losing a lot of raw space. Yeah? In a three-way, in the same way as, as a two-way mirror, the recommended number of nodes is four. Again, because of the maintenance. If you put one in maintenance, you can still afford to lose another one to lose two nodes. And we'll see that in the demo. The next one is the equivalent of what used to be read five. So parity. In the same way as the mirror, you can have a, a single parity, whereby each of the block is divided amongst two of the nodes and a parity block is created, a CRC really, on the third node, right? Again, you can lose one node, minimum three servers. The storage efficiency, it's a calculation. So the more nodes you have, the higher the efficiency will be. You can go all the way up to 80% based on the number of nodes that you add to the system. Then you get the dual parity, which is the same principle, except that now you've got two parities instead of just the one. And again, the storage efficiency goes between 50 and 80% based on the number of nodes that you add to the system, right? Dual parity is the recommended way. We'll see in the performance chapter where you would use parity versus mirror because there is a big, massive performance difference, as you can imagine. Now, that's the slide I like the most um, because I like to bust that out. Um, so multi-resilient volume, it's been, there's been a lot of publicity um, by Microsoft about multi-resilient volume and what it can do. But it has been pushed forward as the way to go every time for storage space to direct, which is not the case. And we'll come to the performance slides in a moment. But what it is, basically, it's through an REFS mechanism allowing you to split your data, your volume, into two separate tiers. You still keep your caching tier, though. So your caching still is your hot data tier. However, you now split your underlying capacity volume into a mirror and a parity. And the data gets rotated. How does it do it? Simple. A write comes in. The write will go to the cache first. Always the cache. And then get destaged into the mirror side of the volume. From there, when your mirror fills up up to 80%, the system will start to destage that, to rotate that to your parity, which is here in cold data, right? So you're moving data around. Any update that is done to the dual parity will get restaged into the mirror. Yeah? And from there, any reads will come either from the parity, if it's there, or from the mirror, always through the cache again. Now, the important component here is we've seen a lot of people asking, oh, okay, so I'll do, I'll do my dual parity on, on spindles. I'll put my mirror on SSDs and I'll put my caching on NVMEs. Great, right? Super performance. No, not at all. 
The beauty of this system is really when you use REFS on the same type of disks. Because if you create your mirror and your parity on just spindles, the moving of the data through the REFS system is super fast. It's just metadata that is moving. However, if you now create your mirror on an REFS on SSDs and have your, your dual parity on uh, uh, spindles, you're going to have to move that data around. So the REFS methodology doesn't work anymore. You're going to have to lift and shift all those blocks, which is a lot of IOPS, a lot of bad thing happens. So keep in mind, yes, multi-resilient volumes, MRVs, have their place for certain type of workloads, but not all of them. Hyper-V, for example, SQL, bad. Fault tolerance. Um, so we'll go through a couple of scenarios, a few scenarios actually, on, on what, what can a system, if you create a four node system like we just did at the start of the uh, presentation, um, with a mirror, with a three way mirror, what can you lose in your system without any sort of data availability loss? Disk in a server, no problem. A complete server goes down, still no problem. If at that point another disk goes down and the server's down, no problem, you're still online. Two disks, a disk and a caching device in another server, no problem either. Two disks in one server, two disks in another server, including a cache, no problem. I'm just running through a, a few scenarios. Important one, two servers go down, we're still up and running. Note that again, there is no data loss here. If your server goes down because, I don't know, because the server just goes down, because there is a network failure or power failure, the data on the disk are persistent. So as soon as it comes back up, the data is available again there in that server. But the data in, in terms of availability of the system is always there at this stage. You can also sustain an enclosure failure if you're using Four, four servers in one enclosure or blades or things like that, you can lose an entire enclosure. So you can make the system redundant enough to know that any server are, are, are placed in a specific enclosure or a specific rack. So we'll see later on, fault domains can be defi defined to say, well, hang on a minute, I always want my data to be replicated across racks, for example, or across data centers. You can now replicate your data from one data center to another. That's part of the product. That's no additional license fee from your supplier, right? So if Melbourne goes down, for example, Sydney stays up, your data, your application stays up. It doesn't incur any fault. Fault domains. So the system allows you to define a set of components that, can, that rely on one failure, basically, on one component that could fail. So, for example, if you have an eight-node system, you can say, well, in rack number one, I'm relying on a power source, I'm relying on the top of a switch rack, et cetera, et cetera. So, I want my data to be, to be replicated, effect, to, be, to be balanced between my two racks instead of being balanced within the same rack. So, if I lose my rack, we're good. So, what you do, you define a fold domain. Before I go there, very important. You need to configure that before you enable storage spaces direct on your cluster. Very important, you can't do it afterwards. Once, you, once you've enabled it, then you enable storage space direct on your cluster. The cluster will not verify if you move things around, so it's not dynamic. It's not gonna go read that you've moved it from one cluster, from one rack to another. That's an important point here too. So once you've done that and enabled it, you then create what we call the fold domain and define those racks, in this case racks, or sites, or enclosures, or whatever you want really and then you create your cluster on top of that. How do you do that? XML file. You can do it all through PowerShell or you can create a simple XML file that will define site name, rack name, each of your nodes, their location. Once your, your uh, XML file is created, you just run a PowerShell command to actually set your fold domain based on the XML file. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the question was, if you want to add a third rack, same principle, you just modify the Excel, XML, sorry, the XML file, and you rerun the command. But it's important to have that first enable command before you create the storage space direct. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between the XML file and the XML file? 
very low. <laughs> so um, the recommendation here, if you want to do real-time transfer, is that harder. So the latency between the two has to, has to be really disk latency stuff. So five milliseconds, I wouldn't go any more than that, really, as a, as a rule of thumb. Right? Now let's um, show you how that resiliency works in our system that we created. So let me switch from that video to the system itself. So you can see here the cluster that we created through the video with my volumes. Um, there is an additional volume here that I created afterwards because you'll see in the performance slides, in the performance demo, I'm using a VM fleet tool which is highly recommended to actually load up the system and you can see what the system can do at that point. Um, so we can see that each of my nodes are up, node number one down to four. Um, and in there, we've got, if we go to, I'm connected to node number one, sorry, I should have mentioned. Um, we've got our volumes here, right? With some of the virtual machine created there for the performance test later on. Um, if we look at the disks, all my disks are online, and they map to a cluster shared volume down here. So let's go and shut down some servers. So if I go on uh, ILO, this, these are HP servers, so I just my out of band management, and let's just switch off one of the servers. See, that will go bye-bye in a moment. If the demo gods are with me, of course. There it is. So you can now see that the server is dead, but my disks are still alive. You can see that each of the disks have an owner. That's a very important point. So every disk has an owner in the system. Every node owns a drive. And every I.O. to that drive will go through that node. So you can come in with an I.O. through your network, through any of the nodes, but that I.O. will be redirected to the specific node that is there. So once a, if, a, if a node goes down, if a server goes down, so in this case server number four went down, but was the owner of disk number four, the disk will get reassigned another node. But your disk doesn't go offline, right? So your disk is still accessible during that, during that period. So you can see here we've got disk number four. It's still accessible. It's still there. If we look in, um, in my C drive, I still have all my volumes that are accessible while my server is now down. So we are really not in luck today. So let's go shut down another server. Something else just happened. Um, it's important to note that I have a three-way mirror on this. Very important. If you have a two-way mirror, you can only sustain one server going down, okay? So the three-way mirror is the highly recommended methodology here. So if we shut down the next one. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. No. Yes, there is. So um, within one node, if you lose a disk, your, your node doesn't go down, your disks don't go down. There's only that disk that will be marked as failed within the, within the node. Your volume will then be marked as degraded. So your, your, your virtual disk that sits across your node is then marked as being degraded, but online and available. At that point, all you have to do is grab the disk, replace the disk, and then the system will repair itself, right? If, and we'll come to that in a moment, if you have left enough capacity, free space on your system, when a, when a disk fails within a node, the system will repair itself automatically and start rebuilding the data on the free space that you have. So that at some point you'll see degrade it, you'll see back online, back to optimal, because it's just rebuilt everything. And then all you have to do is replace that disk. Yeah? Um, so, so let's have a look. Why did you not go down? Oh, it is off. Anyway, let me refresh that. 
Oh, I should down the wrong one. I should. Down <laughs> oh no, it is off. Oh, hang on. Oh well, moving on. Uh, trust me, it works. Uh, <laughs> you can lose a second node. I've done it. I've done it a hundred times before today. I don't know why it doesn't want to shut down. I think it, it knows. You know, it's like, whoa, hang on, you've got one down already. You really want to do that? No, you don't. I'm staying up. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the resiliency for you. Um, let me actually restart that. Because from a performance standpoint, we want all the servers to be up later on. All right. So that was a great demo on resiliency. At least I got one node down. So, but trust me, if you have a, a three-way mirror, you can lose two nodes in your system without any problem. No, no, no data accessibility is lost, right? And no data is lost in this case. As I reboot my nodes, all my data is still there. Yes, Jim? Yeah, so the performance of this uh, two-way mirror, the three-way mirror. Mm -hmm. How many systems? What do you mean by so systems? Like a few nodes all around. The yep. Database. Yes. So it's based on the on the data that you're gonna that you're gonna replicate, right? So if you have a two-way mirror, you got to put that data somewhere else. So now you need two nodes. How many systems? Oh, so up to sixteen. Up to sixteen. Yeah, that's right. No problem. Performance. Now, I know a lot of you know about NVMEs, but I just want to reiterate. The compar quick comparison between SSD and NVMe. NVMe is a, is a fairly new technology whereby we're grabbing effectively an SSD and putting that on the PCIe bus, ergo removing the constraint that we have, the bottlenecks that we have with, with SAS, right? but also CPU. Now, if we compare pricing per gig, and again, these prices were taken about, I'd say, six months ago, so it's probably gone down by now. Um, we can see per gigabyte, we're fairly similar. We're not double, right? Let's face that. Let's say that straight off the bat. Um, we're not similar, but we we we're not double. So, however, if we compare the IOPS to that in a 4K random IOP, we can see the SSD. A classic, typical enterprise SSD will go up to 100,000 IOPS. Make it that. Um, that number comes from an Intel SSD, the S. 3700s, I believe, or the D3700. Um, NVMe, on the other hand, 324,000 IOPS. So we can see for about 50% more increase on price, we get almost three times more IOPS out of the system. So that's a big, massive increase. That's why NVMe's today are slowly starting to replace SSDs as caching mechanism. CPU also is massively reduced because you no longer use that SAS bus. You go straight to the PCIe. So now you're reducing your CPU per 100,000 knobs by about half usage. It's a great mechanism there. So I would recommend NVMe for any caching device. And if you've got the money, go nuts. You know, use it as capacity too. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you choose your drives and resiliency types? Um, so I spoke earlier about uh, multi-resilient volumes, um, but also now in terms of drives and, and resiliency, what, what should you use? So to maximize performance, there's no doubt about it, just go all flash. Right? With the price of SSDs today, you could go all SSDs in the back end and put NVMe on top as, as caching devices, or just do SSDs on both layer. Right? One thing to mention that is very important, if you're going to go for cheaper SSDs or cheaper NVMEs, keep in mind that you need the day, the write per day. Uh, who knows what write per day is? Okay, quick explanation. So on the normal desktop SSD or NVMe, when you buy that you know, for 100 bucks, you get now a terabyte worth of space. I don't know what you get, but anyway. Um, you get about 0.3 writes per day. What does that mean? If you buy 100 gig worth of SSDs, that SSD for, the, for its lifetime that is defined by the manufacturer, three years, five years, can write 30 gig worth of data every day. So for 100 gig, 0.3 writes per day, 30 gig worth of data every day for the lifetime of the device. 
we can see straight away that that could be a problem when we use such devices caching because we're doing a lot of writes for the system, right? A lot of writes. Read, Reads doesn't matter. It's all about the writes. So now we're talking about higher capacity, uh, higher uh, classes devices where you go up to 10 writes per day, for example. So for 100 gig, you can write a terabyte for the lifetime of the device without, having, without it failing. Anyway, that was a quick bracket. So maximize performance, all flash, of course. If you want to maximize capacity, well, you're really looking at an hybrid system. Why an hybrid system? Because you cannot have just spindles in storage places direct. You need a caching device. It's not going to enable without caching. SSD is minimum. If you want a balance of both, well, then you can start looking at MRV, right? Multi-resilient volumes, and have a mix between SSDs and VMEs and HDDs, right? Resiliency types, mirror. Performance. If you want performance, go for a mirror. Anything SQL, any random IOS, small IOS, Hyper-V, VMware, just go mirror, right? Parity, what's that good for? Well, really cold storage, read-only storage. If you have any, any workload out there that does a lot of reads and not a lot of writes, parity is your, is your friend. The good question, when do you use multi-resilient volume? Well, the best really way is to use it for large non-random IOS backups. Fantastic way. Backups is your friend for that. Data processing, video rendering, things like that, right? I would not recommend to use multi-resilient volume with Hyper-V and SQL. There's been a lot of publicity out there to say, yeah, use MRV. Yeah, no, don't. Use a mirror. It's much better. Um, Quick REFS optimization slides. I'm not going to read all through this um, because it's a bit boring, really, but uh, um, I'll highlight a few which are quite important. Um, data corruption detection and repair. That's a very big feature on REFS compared to NTFS, right? Um, the migration in terms of data, when you create a checkpoint, there is no longer any copies. It's just the metadata that gets transferred. So you can create a VHDX. You can... Uh, merges checkpoints in no time at all compared to NTFS. Creative HDX, I just mentioned that. Um, slides will be available, so if you, if you want to read through that, it's uh, REFS is the way to go in the future. Um, networking. Now, I did mention that you need performant networks, right? Oh, wow, an hour. Jeez. I got a. Um, the important one is the east west network. Right? Your replication between each of those nodes is paramount. Okay? You need at least 10 gig between those two, twice, for redundancy. And I'll go as far as saying RDMA as well, because you will s we've seen about 60% 60 per 60 performance increase just by putting RDMA between those nodes. Anyone knows what RDMA is? Okay, beautiful. I'll, I'll running out of time, so I don't really have time. Come and ask afterwards if you don't know. Great. Um, for the north-south uh, uh, traffic, so if you're using Scalar File Server, again, I would recommend RDMA in the front end as well, right? Because you don't want that bottleneck to go to your storage. Yep. Quick demo on performance, and then we'll finish up very quickly. So I'm just going to... VM Fleet, as soon as you walk out of here, Google VM Fleet, it's fantastic. So it's a performance testing, so it's a, stre a, a trust, a, a stress test, thank you, um, for your system. So what, what VM Fleet does, it basically deploys an whole bunch of virtual machines on all your nodes, and then within the virtual machine, just go and create IOPS, basically. Um, so that's what I've got running here. You can see that each of the nodes, the number of IOPS, the number of rewrites, the bandwidth, um, the latency as well, um, as well as the total at the very top. So you can see what, what's produced there. So if I just quickly launch a... Um, so this is a quick, a quick test on 4K IOPS with four threads, um, about 40 IOPS in the queue, 30% uh, write, 60%, 70% read, and I'm running it for 30 seconds. So. Effectively, what I'm simulating there is roughly a Windows, a Windows server, a Windows um, 
server, and it's going to come up in a moment. And it's been failing all morning, so fingers crossed, there it is. It's firing and open. Okay. It's not my day for demos, but that's fine. Uh, what we'll do instead, we'll stop this, and I'll show you what we call a quick here, here. It's going to stop the wind flee. So what that command does, it's, it's going to stop all my virtual machines. So I've got uh, 28 virtual machines running on, this, on the system. It's going to stop them all. Um, so that should produce a bit of ops. Then what I'm going to do is just do a, a, a start, start all the virtual machines at once. Um, just to load up the system instead of using the, uh, the stress mechanism. While this is going, I'm quickly going to run to the demystifying since I am running out of time. Um, questions? Here we go. Multi-resilient volume offer the best performance. Who thinks that's true? Good one. Yes, the message has gone through. Awesome. No, if you want best performance, I can't say it enough. Go for a mirror. You know, the, the amount of call we get, to, we get to go, yeah, I've done what they say. I've you know, taken this article and it says multi-resilient volume and I'm running out of e-machines and running like a dog. Uh, yeah, it's not meant for that, right? If you want performance, go for a mirror. Next one, inserting SSDs in the middle of NVMEs and HDDs makes everything faster. Who thinks that's true? No, that's very wrong. To the contrary, if you have a system, a hybrid system, that includes both NVMe, S all the NVMe SSDs and HDDs, you can have that, it's no problem. What you do with that, you create separate volumes. So nothing prevents you to create a mirror on your SSDs and a mirror on your HDDs and present two separate volumes and put you know, your SQL server and the likes on your SSDs on your mirror and put your file servers onto your spindles on mirror, right? You'll still go through the cache. The caching mechanism will still work for both systems and you'll get the best performance because knowing your workloads is the first law of storage, right? So knowing what your workload produce and where to put it to be optimal is the way to go. Not by just putting an SSDs between NVMEs and, and HDDs, right? Last one, I can build a storage based REC cluster without an RDMA network. Who thinks that's true? <coughs> Correct, but <laughs> <laughs> it is true you can. Uh, the, the actual demo environment there just has an RDMA network in the back end, not the front end, right? The problem is latency. You will see because of the performance increase that you get out of RDMA, with it, your latency is going to go straight down, right? and your IOPS are gonna go straight up. So out of a system that can do, uh, well this one can uh, probably produce about 140,000 IOPS roughly, um, and that's a cheap Intel SSDs and, and, and spindles. Um, you put the same with our, a, an RDMA system, you get at least 300,000 IOPS without breaking a sweat. Very important nodes though, within your nodes, be careful of the CPU. Okay, the CPU becomes the bottleneck, not the memory. It's the CPU. Your CPU is going to creep up. So for every node that you create, don't go for a single socket with four cores, for example. I definitely go a dual socket for four cores, six cores, 12 cores each. The more CPU you have in your nodes, the better, the better performance. Um, last slide, capacity planning, and then we can go for a beer. Um, capacity planning. Just a few numbers here. Caching, rule of thumb, in most systems out there, we see about 10 to 15% of the usable space. So if you put a terabyte worth of usable space in your spindles, make sure you've got at least 100 gig in each of the nodes for your capacity. Yeah? So 10 to 15. Again, know your workloads, right? Define what's hot, what's not, because in a tiered system, in a hot gold data, there's nothing worse than to have too little caching. You're gonna, you're gonna keep just churning around caching to capacity, capacity, caching, and it's just gonna run badly. The reserves pool, pool space, we, we touched on that very quickly, very briefly. Um, allow at least the equivalent of two disks free space, so that when one a disk fails, 
the system can automatically repair itself and move the data onto those spare disks that you have in the system. Yeah? So two disks is, is, a, is a rule of thumb for, the, for the, uh, the, the pool space reserve. By default, your fold domain is the node. We saw earlier the fold domain and how to create that, how to say a fold domain is right. By default, one node is a fold domain. Yeah? So the system will always try and put data, multiple pieces of data, the same data, on multiple nodes because the node become the fold domain. Yeah? Ideally, reserve at least one node for capacity. For, expand, for If a node fails completely and the data is lost on, the, on that node, not on the system, or on that node, you can then automatically let the system repair itself onto another node. Yeah? So that's our ideal scenario. Of course, well, we've got more money investment because you need that additional node that just sits there, basically. Um, this is the maximum number you can have in your storage places direct system. 16 nodes maximum and 416 disks. No more than that. Nothing prevents you to create another cluster next to it and have another one and another one and another one, but that's the maximum you can get into one system. Yep. And just quickly before we go there, going to start that fleet of servers. So we can see here, we should create some nice, uh, nice high ops there. Um, there it goes. There's a bit storm. It's going to creep up in a minute. Um, so that's 20, uh, 28 machines starting up Windows 2016 core um, on the system without really breaking a sweat. Note the latency. It never really goes above two, three. It'll spike to about five milliseconds, but that's it. Um, reason why is NVMEs, right? You, I've got an NVME in each of those nodes, it just absorbs everything. Uh, all the writes, all the reads. I know I'm not creating a lot of IOPS there, um, and I wish the other one would, would work, but it doesn't. So come see me later if you want to see it in action, I'll, I'll repair it. It's been working all week, and now today it's just start to fail. Yeah. Demo gods. There's the Murphy, he's always lurking in the corners. Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's that, unfortunately. Um, so don't forget, last but not least, filling your evaluations. Um, as uh, Daniel said yesterday in his presentation, everyone from Vigilant IT, when you fill up your, your feedback, you get twice the chance to actually do the drone. <laughs> do it. Just kidding. Um, but yeah, please complete your session evaluation. Any questions? Yes. Um, no, actually, you can scale it um, uh, fairly fairly well um, in terms of automate the scale. You, you mean the number of nodes, or do you mean the number of disks, or? Right, yes, but what you basically you're scaling out in this case, so you just add more nodes to, to go against that problem of you know um, absorbing more more IOPS and more CPU. As we saw in the in the in the uh, screen there when I was watching the nodes, the total amount of IOPS that you can you can deliver will really depends on the number of nodes that you have. The more nodes you have, the more IOPS you're gonna you're gonna deliver because your spindle increase and your network increase and everything else increases, right? Um, but let's take that one offline if you want to. Yes? No, to the contrary. Don't use RAID controllers. That's a, that's a good point. Because even if you do a, if you do a RAID controller, even if you define a RAID zero for each of the spindles, you have to present your disks effectively as a just a bunch of disks, right? Red zero is bad because you're going to have the overlay of, of RAID, which is going to bring down your performance. So what you want is just a dumb HBA, right? Or just a hose bus adapter, just a controller. 
and present just those disks as, as simple disks to Windows. That's, that's it. Yes, absolutely. Bad. No right. Um, no, so what, what we have in this system, we still keep the actual RAID controller that is built in on the motherboard, um, and we have just a dual RAID 1 for the operating system, and then we segregate everything else through a, through a uh, HPA, I think it's a LSI um, 9200 something. Um, so it's, in the demo here, the, it's very cheap out of the way. I mean, the entire system probably cost about $10,000, that's it, right? So they've just built on, on DL380's HPs done. Um, so it's a, it's a very cheap system. One thing that I didn't mention, since you stayed, you didn't get the call for the beer, awesome. Um, one little, one little add-on, um, you can rebalance your data in storage spaces direct compared to storage spaces. So in storage spaces, you have all your data sitting there on four nodes, for example, right? And all your data is building up and your disks are filling up to the point where you need to add one more. When you add new disks in storage spaces, those disks are empty, and all your data stays where it is, and new writes are coming in and start to spread around onto the new disks and the old disks. With Storage Spaces Direct, you can rebalance that. And if you go from four to five nodes, for example, and you got 80% usage, you can rebalance that so it's more 70% across the 60% maths, 60 <laughs> across all the nodes, right? So you can then rebalance. That's a job, though. Note that that's not automated. So it's PowerShell command, you just run the PowerShell at night when there is no load on the system, and off you go, you rebalance. Yeah, yes? So the column size is created, actually, with storage spaces, the column size was very important, right? Uh, the performance was really determined by the column size. With storage spaces direct, uh, Microsoft has tr is trying to completely remove that component. So the recommendation is never to modify the column sizes. The system will define itself what the best performance is based on what you want to create and the number of nodes that you created on. You can still define it. It's def the, the definition of, a, of, a, of the column is at the time when you create your volume. But you can create a volume with four columns and on the same storage pool create another volume with 10 columns if you want, right? So that's, that's no problem. It's at the time when you create the volume. But again, do not touch the columns in storage spaces direct. It's all done for you in the back end. Yes? Yeah, yeah. There is, so the question is, is there any maximum number of drives per cache device within a node? No, right? So it's all depending on the performance. So you, you don't want 16 disks or, or, or 100 disks to one caching device, for example. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. Well, every single, so a 16 terabytes SSD, for example, you're still going to get limited by the number of IOPS for that one device. So it's, it's the good old argument of saying, well, if I want a terabyte worth of space in my system, do I go for 10 times 100 gig, or do I go for one big one terabyte? Well, the answer is it depends. You know, it depends on the number of IOPS you need for your system. If you need more IOPS, you need more spindles. It's the same principle for the caching. The more caching device you put in, the more combined IOPS you're going to get out of the system, basically. Yes? Yes, so the question was, can you throttle the right speed on repair? Yes, you can give, um, 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 you can give a, 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 a priority on the repair, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's not specifically granular, but it's low, normal, high, basically. Yeah, so it will, it will interrupt it, though, if there is a lot of IOPS demand. So you can, you can, you can basically tell the system if I'm going to get smashed by a, you know, by, by a SQL query, slow down, right? Give, give priority to my loads, except uh, aside from the repair, right? Yes? Yes, so the, the, is the caching global to every volume? The answer 
is yes. So the caching is automatically created for you. Every time you create a volume, by default, the cache will be assigned to that volume, right? So so is that a? Yeah. So when you. No, no, you get the entire caching for that volume. So you can define that. So when you create your volume, again, not recommended by Microsoft, but when you create a volume, you can say, you know what? I don't want the entire NVMe for that. I just want 10 gig. You can do that. In the PowerShell command to create a new volume, you can say, I want this amount of write cache. I want this amount of read cache even. But again, the recommendation is just to leave the system determine that for you. So the, the caching engine, that's right, that's all dynamic. It'll just pick it up and add it to the, add it to the list, right? Yes? Yep. Mm -hmm. So the question was, if you have a group of capacity disks and one of the disks fail, do you just have to rebuild that disk or the entire capacity, just that disk? Yes, so whatever data was on that disk will be recreated onto whatever capacity you have. If you don't have enough free space, the system will wait until you replace the disk and then will recreate all the data onto that disk. Yeah? Yes? Are you going to consider it different? Say again, sorry? Are you going to consider it different? Right, so dedupe today, the question was about deduplication. Um, dedupe today is not available on our EFS. When it comes down to storage spaces direct, it's REFS, right? So you need to use REFS in the system, therefore there is no deduplication available today. <laughs> yes? That's right. So the, the, the way you calculate your, your cache versus capacity, and the, again, the rule of thumb, you know, uh, I want to reiterate that. It's not going to be applicable to all systems. But if you have a terabyte across four nodes, for example, and you decide to do a two-way mirror, which is not the recommended, but it's easier for mathematics. <laughs> if you have 500 gig across four nodes, the recommendation would be around 50 gig of cache across the four nodes, right? So now you say, well, I need 50 gig roughly for my hot data, so therefore I'm gonna go two SSDs per node, so I'm gonna get eight SSDs, 50 gig divided by eight. That's the size per node, per SSDs per node. Does that make sense? It's usable space across the system. That's exactly right. That's right, after the mirror, three-way mirror, two-way mirrors. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we just finished ours. Um, that was 78 gig terabytes. That's it, so far. Say again. Upper V. So anything from domain control, SQL Server, Exchange Service, pretty much everything that you can think of in a Windows environment. And we got all three, um, but we didn't use multi-resilient volumes. We went, uh, uh, that's correct, yes. We, we separate our volumes, correct. Yes? Well, so that's a good question. If you just do NVMe, how do you do caching? So by default, the system will grab whatever different NVMe you get. So no, not by default. You can define a slower NVMe for your capacity. So we spoke about the writes per day, for example. So you can buy two NVMe's at 10 writes per day and the rest of NVMe's at 0 0.3 and define within your PowerShell, with a PowerShell command that the 0 0.3 D type of device are for my capacity, the other one is for caching, right? If you don't have a difference, by default the system will just use everything as cache effectively. Right? And go, well, this is just my capacity drives, that's it. Yeah? Yes? 
Yeah, you, sorry. <laughs> you in the white shirt over there. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the redundancy and the load balancing will be done through uh, SMB multi-channel um, because the system will go, well, I can connect there. Oh, hang on, I got another connection here. It's just going to load balance between the two. And if one fails, the other one takes over, basically. No, 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 just throw the cards in, assign two different IP addresses on two separate subnets, off you go. Let the system do it for you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so fill in your evaluations. Um, if you've got more questions, I'll be around for a yeah, beer. I'll be around with a beer at the party, so just come and see me. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.